we are studying sources of linguistic variation, and we are connecting it to the question of what identifies you? What sort of characteristics make you, you? One answer to this question is you are who you are because you grew up somewhere. So your geographical origin is part of your identity, and it also influences the variation in your language. In this video, we'll look at other sources of variation, which are indeed markers of your identity. We looked at geographical origin, but in this video, we're going to look at social class, gender, age, and race as markers of identity and therefore um, factors that can influence your linguistic choices. By the way, all of these factors have one thing in common, the relatively stable characteristics. You could change them throughout your life, but you can't change them from one minute to the other. All right, let's um, get started with our trip. This is a map of the east of the United States, and it shows you the non-rhotic dialects. So most dialects in the U.S. are rhotic in that the R's at the end of words are pronounced, like in corner. However, there are many non-rhotic dialects in the U.S., like, for example, the dialect of New York City, where people, uh, some people would say something like corner without the R. So those are non-rhotic dialects. Imagine you wanted to find out who uses the R and who doesn't. And imagine you're in New York in the 1960s. This is a very famous experiment by a sociolinguist called William LeBoff. You're in the 60s, you're in New York, and you want to figure out who uses the R and who doesn't. You go to three stores. One of them is very fancy and expensive. One of them is regular, and one of them is a discount store. So one of them is expensive, halfway, um, not so expensive. You know that the shoes are on the fourth floor. So you ask people, where are the shoes? And they could tell you one of two things. They could tell you they're on the fourth floor, or they could tell you they're on the fourth floor, with and without the R. Then you pretend you didn't understand them and say, excuse me, where? And then you they are going to give you an emphatic version. They're going to say, fourth floor with the R or fourth floor without the R. And then you run off and write your answer on your little pad and you become one of the founders of sociolinguistics. So that was an experiment and these are the results. Please try to take a moment to analyze the patterns and figure out what's going on in this figure. Please pause the video. All right, so the most important pattern here is that in the more expensive the store, the more you're going to find R in fourth floor. So in Saks Fifth Avenue, which was the expensive store, uh, in floor you find, it, you find an R 63% of the time. In Macy's, uh, which is the less expensive one, People said it 44% of the time in the natural conversation, the first one. And in Kleins, which is a discount store, people said it 8% of the time. So LaBeouf figured out that the R, the roticity uh, of someone's speech, was related to social class. The higher up you were in social class, the more you would tend to use the R. On the other hand, the working class shoppers at Kleins tend to use the R less. So the R was a marker of social class in the area. This is the first major pattern that you can see here. And it is a good moment to tell you about overt and local or covert prestige. So we have that the R is associated with the, high, with the higher social class and the non-rhotic, uh, as in fourth floor, was associated with working class. Overt prestige is prestige that is uh, that a linguistic marker has if it's associated with higher status speech, higher social class, and so forth. Society tends to think that these are better or nicer ways to speak. So this is prestige that is visible to everyone or overt. Local or covert prestige, on the other hand, is associated with varieties that are not standard, but that sound more natural, more straightforward, more uh, legit 
they sound they make you sound like who you really are as opposed to poshy for example so you can see how having the r is a marker of overt prestige that associates you with a higher class and having non-rotic speech would be associated with working class yes but in within this working class uh, not having it uh, if you speak with that with an r they're gonna think you're a phony they're going to expect you to speak without the R, and this is going to make you sound more real, more natural, and so forth. So it's not just a matter of things being good or bad. Both of these markers have a function in society. They have overt prestige or local or covert prestige. Notice that there's another pattern here. The middle class is in a little bit of a bind. They have to decide whether they're going to emulate the speech of the higher class or of the working class. And as a matter of fact, in the emphatic pronunciation, the people in the middle tend to approach the higher class as much as they can. In fourth, uh, in fourth floor, the emphatic version, the uh, sellers at Macy's tend to go as high as the high class. So they're trying to emulate their speech. They're trying to have overt speech markers in their production of the words. But not that having uh, the non rhotic dialect is worthless. Again, it has prestige with your friends, with your family. Whenever you want to sound like who you truly are, you would use the covert varieties. So that is a pattern that relates social class with the speech that you use. This is a different experiment by another social linguist called you know, Peter Trudgell, who worked in England. And he worked with varieties of English that had ing in working, versus IN, the alveolar N, as in workin. This chart tells you the use of the alveolar variant, workin, according to class and whether people uh, identified as men or women. Please pause the video and try to figure out what the pattern is in this chart. Please pause the video. This chart is really interesting. Uh, first of all, the women here with the little rhomboid and the little pyramid use less of the alveolar variant. They tend to have more working than working. The uh, working class men are the ones who use working with the alveolar the most. The working class women are second. The middle class men are third. And the people who use the IN variant the least are the middle-class women. When middle-class women are in formal settings, like reading or in formal speech, they don't use the alveolar variant at all to stay as far away from it as possible. 0% and 2%. They only say working with an ing. However, when they are in, in casual speech, they overshoot the men, and then they are more they use more of the in variant, working. And this is because women are at a particular bind in our societies. They have to be more than the men. When they speak standard, they have to be even more standard. When they are expected to be casual, they have to be even more casual, which explains this crossover pattern. As you can see here, the women have to be, the middle class women have to be the most formal they can. They have 0% of work in with the alveolar. But when they're needed to be casual, they have to be even more casual than the men. So they have more of the alveolar variant working than the men of the middle class. This is an interaction of class and gender. Women in the middle class are particularly caught in this dynamic of trying to use their speech to represent um, social mobility, but also trying to confront a world that is hostile to them and that needs them to be so much more at every step. So they have to be more formal in formal settings and more casual in casual settings. So your gender identity is also a source of linguistic variation. Let us now switch to race. This is a very important experiment by John Rickford in the 1990s. So there is a black woman who speaks African American English, and she's speaking with two different people. Another black woman who also speaks African American English, and a white woman who speaks standard American English. As we have seen before, African American English morphology has several identifying features. For example, the copulas tend to be zero, as in he a teacher, versus he is a teacher. 
as we have seen, there's nothing wrong with that. This is the way Russian and Arabic do sentences. In African-American English morphology, verbs tend to lose their uh, third-person agreement. So she would say, she think you don't care, which again is something that um, Swedish does, many Germanic languages do. So this is uh, a black woman talking to another black woman and to a white woman. Please take a moment to try to figure out the pattern of what's happening. Please pause the video. Mm -hmm. As you can see, this is a quantitative measurement of code switching. She uses markers of African American English, so she does. Uh, she has few copulas in uh, uh, overall, but she drops more of the copulas when she's speaking with another black woman compared to when she's speaking with a white woman. Only 30% of her sentences have copulas when she's speaking with the black woman as opposed to 60% with the white woman. Likewise, only 27% of her verbs have third-person agreement when she's speaking with a black woman, and 63% of them ha uh, have the agreement when she's speaking with a white woman. So first of all, yes, her race is uh, a source of linguistic variation, but also it's not like her race completely determines uh, how she's going to speak. She has... Uh, she's also aware of her interlocutor, and so she decides to use her markers in one frequency with another black woman and a different frequency with a white woman. And we all do this. We have identities, but we also accommodate to the people we're speaking to. I won't give you an example of variation by age because you know them. <laughs> like, there's plenty of words that you know are different from how you use them from your parents. But these are all... Um, what people used in the very first studies of sociolinguistic, broad categories to explain how your language varied, like social class, uh, gender, your race, your age. All these categories are broad, but they're also not built by you. You don't get to decide what age you are. You don't get to decide where you grew up. So these characteristics can change, but they're relatively stable, or they can change really slowly. And you might not have uh, built them yourself. They might have come in pre-built and then you associated yourself with them. In the next video, we're going to study how sociolinguistics switched from these broader categories onto categories that people, people built themselves.